Welcome to The Art of the Short Story, a program in the all-virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. Also, this event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, New Dominion Bookshop, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Thanks to our community partners for this event, the Bridge Progressive Arts Initiative and the Muse Writer Center. We also greatly appreciate the support of all festival sponsors, donors, and community partners. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. John Lanchester, author of Reality and Other Stories, is also author of the novels The Debt to Pleasure, Capital, and The Wall, and a regular contributor to the London Review of Books and The New Yorker. His work has been translated into 25 languages, and his books have won numerous awards, including the Whitbread First Novel Prize, the Hawthornden Prize, and the E.M. Forster Award. Tipping Chen, author of Land of Big Numbers, Stories, has worked, pub worked published in or has work published in or forthcoming from The New Yorker, Granta, Guernica, Tin House, and The Atlantic. A reporter with The Wall Street Journal, she was previously a correspondent for the paper in Beijing and Hong Kong. And our moderator, Courtney Mom, author of Before and After the Book Deal, is also author of the novels Costa Alegre, Touch, and I am having so much fun here without you. Thank you all for joining us today. Courtney, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction, and thank you to the festival for hosting us. Um, before we kick things off tonight, I did want to take a moment to just take a little pause and hold a little space for the horrific killings in Atlanta and to acknowledge the pain, stress, anger, and confusion that this has added um, for many people on top of a an incredibly challenging year inside of an incredibly challenging decade. And then I wanted to acknowledge also the power of art and literature to connect people and to get, to allow people to get to know others that they might not meet, to understand cultures that they might not get an into a chance to know intimately. Um, so I couldn't be happier to, to be speaking with, with these two incredible authors today. And, you know, when we do these conversations, we, the moderator says, you know, buy their books. But I implore you tonight that these two collections, Lands of Big Numbers and Reality and Other Stories, the whole world exists in these, these two collections. There's so much, and we, we're not going to touch upon, you know, even a small percentage of it tonight, but please, please do buy their books and um, follow them online and, and whatnot. But we're, we're so happy to have you here. Um, so to kick things off, um, anyone here who has tried to pitch their writing or pitch an article or write an artist statement knows that it is much, much harder to um, write about our writing and to summarize our writing than to sit down and write. But um, we're gonna try to do that tonight anyway. <laughs> um, out of respect for the people who haven't had a chance yet to read these two collections, I was hoping that in your own words, uh, John and Taping, if you could tell us a little bit about what your collections are about, if you figured it out, because I know sometimes even after the fact, we're not 100% sure what our, our books are about. But um, Taping, would you like to, to start? Tell us a little bit about what the Land of Big Numbers is about. Sure, yeah. And thank you so much for having me here. And just, um, yeah, it's really exciting to get to share our third book, um, which... Um, Oh gosh. So Land of Big Numbers is a collection <laughs> of short stories, which I wrote when I was living in Beijing as a correspondent with the Wall Street Journal. And so they are, they're fiction, um, but very much rooted in my years there, both as a reporter um, and also just as uh, someone who's spent a lot of time in the country traveling and talking, um, meeting everyone from human rights lawyers to um, striving college students to rural inventors, um, some of whom you'll meet in this book. 
book. Um, the book is full of men and women in love and um, robots who exist purely to make noodles and um, <laughs> men in the countryside who try and build their own airplanes from scratch, even though they're farmers who have never flown before. Um, all kinds of stories that are um, wondrous and surprising and full of the kind of spirit that um, I just was so struck by um, in my years living in China. Um, and I hope, especially in this moment when, um, you know, so many of us feel stuck in place, um, that the book can offer um, both, as Courtney put it, you know, so well, a sense of empathy and um, you know, getting to see stories that are often difficult to access. And as well, the book contains a lot of delicious food. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, something, again, that many of us are missing the pleasures of getting to, to travel and experience the world. Um, maybe more viscerally. So yeah, I, I hope it offers all that. And thank you again for the chance to share. Thank you. So that was an excellent summary. And it really does remind one that the, the, the cheapest and safest way to travel right now is uh, via your independent bookstore and, and pick up um, actually short story collections because you get to many different places quicker than you would with a novel, right? What about you, John? How would you summarize the, the incredible stories in reality? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I suppose they're um, they're not quite ghost stories. They're not quite spooky stories. There's a um, a rather wonderful German word, uh, unheimlich. It means unhomely, or it has a connotation of something you think you're going to recognise, and then you look more closely at it, and you realise it's not what you thought. Freud was fascinated with the word unheimlich, and uh, he used this image of seeing someone that you think is your mother and then you look more closely and you realize it isn't. How terrifying. <laughs> very, very scary, yeah. And this specific thing of like, but not like. Um, and it crept up on me. I wrote one story, which was a sort of fairly classic um, English ghost story set in a country house. And then a few months went past and I wrote um, uh, another story about an academic um, ending up with a downloading an audio book in the graveyard and then the audio book starts back in a sort of unnatural haunted way and then um i wrote i can't remember what the third one was um a, a, another story with a sort of spooky altered reality premise and at that point i realized i was sort of halfway to doing a collection so i didn't sit down in cold blood to write it, it just sort of crept up on me and i was about halfway through and my wife said to me you realize all these stories have technology and mobile phones in. Of course, it's on purpose, obviously. <laughs> and, then, and then I went away and thought about it. I thought, yeah, actually, that's right, they do. Um, and realized that you know, this had sort of crept up on me. I mean, it's strange what the unconscious does. It definitely has a theme around technology and the uncanny and the kind of the ghost in the ghost in the machine, the spirit behind the kind of wiring and plumbing. Um, and the, and the kind of coalesce, coalesce sort of coalesce, coalesced around that. I love that. <laughs> the, you all really have to get the book for the audiobook story. It, it's, um, it's terrifying, but seems possible. Um, so we're very lucky tonight because both of our authors agreed to do something pretty fun, seeing that tonight's panel is called The Art of the Short Story. We were discussing how regardless of genre or length, whether it's a short story, a novel, a memoir, what have you, um, the art of the short story is really about the art of revising the short story. Um, and rather than have our authors read tonight something, a, a passage that I hope you will get to experience because you're going to listen to me and buy these incredible books, <laughs> I was hoping that each of them could um, could read something that didn't make it into the book for, for, for one for one reason or another. And we can talk a little bit about, or I can't, I will listen to why, why it didn't make it in. So if we, if we stick with this order to ping, would you mind going first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so not only is it a part of the story that didn't wind up, it's also under a different title. So um, I'm looking at an email that I sent my husband with the story as I'd written it. Um, the very first iteration, when it was called Seasons of Light, it subsequently became titled Shanghai Murmur. Um, and I'll just begin. Um, okay, so this is from the start. What would have been the start of the story? 
The signs appeared without notice one morning, nothing formal, just pieces of paper that read, not open to sightseers. They'd been stapled to the wooden siding and stuck with wide strips of blue tape to the walls. And for a while, no one seemed sure who'd put them up there. Shally supposed it had started with the art students. They'd begun turning up last fall, armed with sketch pads and charcoal. She liked watching them as they sat rendering the brick archways and carved wooden frescoes in miniature, casting them in black and white and silvery lead. Up until the day that one of them had brought a camera and started taking pictures of the building, shots of the laundry lines, its shadowy interior, none of the residents had seemed to mind either. But someone had pointed the boy out to some of the squatters and word had spread. Shelley had watched as they'd run him off the grounds, first making him open up his camera and hand over the film, curled in his palm like a snail. She didn't feel sorry for the boy, but she would have liked to see his photographs. It was the most extraordinary building Shelley had ever seen. Tall windows rounded at the top and one sweeping staircase and a bas relief out front featuring a cacophony of grapes, gargoyles, and at the center, a sphinx. The residents all said the building was French. Its gray brick facade was badly weathered, but its lines still unmistakable. The roof line a syncopated series of small turrets and curved flourishes, including one that culminated in a bell sconce shaped like a gourd, though the bell had long since vanished. Years later, Chalet would return to the city and find out that it was more likely Italian, commissioned and built by a banker around a half century ago. The banker had evidently abandoned it after his wife in Europe decided she didn't want to move to Shanghai. After all, there was a war on. The banker had shelved his architectural visions and gone home to join her. At the moment, it stood delicately rotting from the inside, where much of its structure had been torn up and replaced with whitewashed partitions of uneven height that in places only rose up about seven feet high in the air. The halls were heaped with red plastic and white grocery bags tied up with trash, looking like slightly deflated balloons around which shiny shelled cockroaches scuttled. The thin coating of oil and grime on the walls was part dirt, part human. In the morning, you could hear birdsong. Chalet heard it from her second floor partition through a tall casement divided roughly down the middle by her plywood wall, a window she shared with her neighbor who preferred keeping it open at all hours and insisted on hoisting the curtain, a thick prickly linen sticky to the touch with age just after dawn. A retiree who'd worked at a pharmaceutical company before being fired when her mind started to prematurely soften, she had the critical bargaining chip on her side, the curtain rod. Chalet didn't mind the open air, but wished that they could agree to compromise on certain hours for the curtain, or that she could figure out a way to rig one up just for her side. For now, she settled by tying a shirt over her face when she was invariably woken up in the morning by the light, which streamed in bright and pure and directly into her eyes. Thank you so much for sharing. So that, um, again, for people who have not read the beginning to the story that became Shanghai Murmur, mm -hmm. that's quite, quite different. I'll, I'll read you the first sentence um, of, of the published story, published under the title Shanghai Murmur. The man who lived upstairs had died and it had taken the other tenants days to notice. Much different beginning. Can you, <laughs> yeah. can you talk us through a little bit about the permutations here specifically with what you just read um, and your sort of decision points up to, you know, the new, the new opening that is now published in the, in the book? Sure. Yeah. So that story, I mean, I had started writing it as I find I would start many of my short stories just with an image or an impression and not knowing exactly where it was going. And in that case, um, it was I was writing quite clearly about a building um, that I passed often um, near my home. And it, it always struck me. And um, it was sort of this de decrepit yet beautiful, you know, once beautiful um, building as um, you heard just now. And it, it just, I always wondered about its inhabitants. It seemed to be occupied by sort of squatters. And so I started writing about a woman who lived in one of, you know, one of these sorts of um, kind of partitioned rooms within this building. And she was a young woman. I knew that. And I knew that she loved beauty and she was, you know, sensible to the charm of the place where she lived, but also living in squalor and evidently in Shanghai. And um, I was, so I, I, as I wrote, um, you know, I, I began just in, in, in the way that you were just now, you know, sort of evoking the building. And the very next paragraph, which um, I didn't read, but it is then, you know, we, we, we understand that a man in her building has died. And 
it was really only after I'd finished the story and obviously sent it to my husband in this email draft that I had uh, just read, <laughs> um, you know, and going back over it and reading it and realizing that what had led me to the story originally, which was just my feeling of fascination with this building and kind of the delight that I took in getting to evoke it because it really was such a striking um, piece of architecture and strangeness to be found in a city like Beijing, where I was living at the time where, you know, again, mostly architecture is like, you know, it's, it's these, it's a gray kind of monolith um, of a city much of it and to find this old sort of piece of architecture again strangely occupied by seeming squatters was just so fascinating and, and, and I love getting to write about it but as soon as I read through again with a more critical eye it was very clear this has nothing to do with the story the story begins with a dead man and so I just I had to lose all I mean the building the entire starting point of that story ended up getting cut entirely though you know of course what was left was Shelley this woman who was living um, at the bottom of society in a city that held a lot of beauty and had once held much more. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I mean, people's intimate processes are never, they, I'm, I'm so fascinated by them. And it sounds like at least the way you came to this particular story reminds me of how I get to stories, which are published stories, which is by deleting the first 11% <laughs> because, you know, it's sort of like, in the olden times when we get together with friends and sometimes it takes us a little while to hit our steam when we're telling a story at a dinner party, right? And people are looking at you like, yeah, that's your, your spouse, if you have one's like, honey, get to the point. <laughs> it takes us a while because we have to separate out what, what interest, what, what we find interesting from unfortunately or fortunately, you know, what our readers will find interesting and, and, while I can, you know, the beauty, the beauty of the building and the intrigue of the building, but the reader's like, who cares? Who lives <laughs> yeah. inside? Of right? What about John? John, let's hear what you you have to share. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, well, just on that note, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, the simplest and crudest and often best advice about writing is that famous phrase, slaughter your darling. Yeah. It's often the thing that you're, it's often the thing you're most in love with is the thing that doesn't quite work. Um, and takes a long time to, in fact, I was going to say it takes a long time to get used to that, but actually you never do. It's always agony. Um, so there is a <laughs> strange part of the process is that your very favourite bit at the beginning is very, very often the thing you reluctantly end up chucking out at the end. Or book um, titles. I find that happens a lot. You think you have the absolute perfect title for a short story, title for a novel, and then um, the minute you hand it over to a gatekeeper, there's lots of reasons why it's a terrible title, or they think it's, and that's always hard, but. Well, all the other um, bad thing is you, you tell them the title and they say, what? Right. <laughs> um, um, well, so let's yeah. have a listen, John. What do you have to share with us? There's a, a story called The Children's Wing, uh, okay. which isn't, uh, isn't in the book, um, uh, for reasons which I'll explain in a minute. And this is, uh, this isn't, it's about a pair of sisters living in a house. So close, so thick, we seem, my sister and me. Everybody said so. It must have helped that we had our own separate wing at home. That makes it sound much grander than it was. Makes it sound like it was a mansion, a palace, a castle. But to us, it just seemed a big house. A part of it stuck out to one side. And once my sister and I were old enough to mind ourselves, that's where we stayed, where we slept, where we played where we spent our days. We'd only come over to the big part of the house for meals. And perhaps that's where everyone got the impression that we were off in our separate world. Of course, our parents were off in a separate world too. Upstairs in the big house, their huge bedroom surrounded by all the other huge bedrooms. Downstairs was where the living happened, the kitchen and the dining room and the sitting rooms and the hallway. Those were the places we'd see other people because that's where guests came, and they did come downstairs in the big house, where the public part of our family life used to happen. My sister and I used to talk about going over there and finding that there were no grown-ups left, or that the house had burned down. One of our regular fantasies was that we'd go over at supper time and there'd be food on the table, but there'd be no people. In fact, no people left anywhere else in the world. 
just us. It was a scary thought, but we both knew also that it was secretly very exciting. No people left in the world except the two of us. Games and jokes and our language and our world expanded to be the whole world with nothing else. As I say, it makes me sad to think back to how it was between my sister and me. I can't remember if it was already changing before the fire. All right, well, John, you'll have to tell us because I'm on the edge of my seat dying to know what happens to these children. So that sounds like a great story. So what, what <laughs> why, why was it on the, uh, why was it put on the chopping block? Everything burns down and it's just the two of them left and the sister becomes more and more scary. And um, she keeps coming over and whispering things in her sister's ear that other people can't quite hear. And the last line of the story is, there's people coming in company. It's the first time they have a group of friends over to, or not friends, acquaintances over to the house. And she just comes over and whispers in her ear, I have a very long needle. Oh, Lord. Yes. Um, but um, it, it didn't work. It didn't, I, I can't tell, I haven't actually read it today. From your suggestion was the first time I've read it since I finished it um, about 18 months ago, a bit more. Uh, and my my wife, I think, to Ping, you're obviously the same emailing it to your husband. My wife reads my stuff first. And um, she's just said um, it doesn't fit. She's a writer too, so we can speak in sort of writer shorthand. Um, and she was and, actually speaking in terms of it not fitting in the rest of the collection. You'd written enough. Yeah, I'd written all the other stories in it. And um, and I, and I, there's, there's a funny thing about editorial input. I often think, if you, the only kind that's really useful is things you've been thinking about yourself. If, if it sort of completely comes from left field, it can easily be that thing about, you know, but this is an apple and I'd rather have an orange. You know? mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> we've all been you there. Know, there's lots of it, <laughs> might be right, but it kind of doesn't. But things you've been going on the one hand, on the other hand, and I had slightly been thinking, I, hmm. wonder, I wonder if, as it were, this belongs in a different book. And she, and she instantly and firmly said, no, it doesn't fit. And so I, I, um, uh, I put it to one side. I mean, that's the thing that, you know, does happen with books. You have things that sort of uh, work in their own terms, but just don't belong. I've had that happen to characters in novels. You, sure. you, can, you have a character who's just sort of seems vivid and things like that to you, but just sort of has some sort of wandered in from a different book. And that's basically the story, the case with this story. It's sort of, it's wandered in from another book. I think that's a really in a very interesting and, and specific preoccupation for short story collections, deciding what belongs and, and what doesn't. Did you, did you have any stories, Tipping, that you either started or finished that, that didn't make the cut or characters that started to push themselves in and yeah. weren't uh, welcome? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were some, I should say, so I, I've always loved short stories, um, but the Land of Big Numbers was really, it was my first time trying trying to figure out how to write short stories. And so I um, I had actually, I'd been working on a novel and then I had sort of been stuck and um, writing these short stories was in many ways my way of, of just kind of figuring out how to write about the world that I was in and, and um, feeling like it sort of gave me really a new lease of life with the material. And I think, so for me, the ones that fell out were um, not so much thematically out of place, just I didn't think they were, good, you know, quite good yeah. enough. Um, there was, I, but there were, there were some, you know, that I really um, wanted to work. One, which I, especially now in this moment, I'm, I'm sorry that didn't, uh, it didn't work. It's um, one that was called Sh uh, China Syndrome. It was about a very, highly contagious um, skin disease that sweeps the globe and it shuts down economies. And um, yeah, it's, it sends the world into kind of the social tailspin and everything. Um, anyway, we see we see sort of effects um, not too dissimilar from some that we've seen this year. Um, but that was one that seemed almost too, yeah, tonally, I mean, it was, it was, it was engaged with China, which the collection of course uh, very much is, but I think tonally it was a little bit too much um, it was like a little too cheeky almost um, and, and not not really engaging with the same sorts of themes. Um, but that was one that I was sorry. I couldn't quite make it work. Um, maybe maybe we'll revisit someday. 
It's funny, right? It is a little bit like failed short stories or manuscripts of any length. They are, you know, relationships that we couldn't get to work out. Yeah. Um, but, exactly. you know, in theory, they don't die, really. Our, our urge to resuscitate them might, but, um, you know, it is, it is a privilege, I think, of our craft that we can pick these relationships up many, many years down the, sometimes decades down the road and say, you know what, Mr. Ex-boyfriend story, <laughs> I'm going to try to make it work with you. Um, well, thank you so much for, for both of you sharing that intimate um, slaughtered work, as, as John says. Um, I, so was doing the cyber stalking of both of you and uh for for john i came upon a um a positive review of his by a reader on 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 the evil a m a z o n where you should not buy your books um please buy them from independent bookstores but the the reviewer again it was a five-star review very positive as all reviews are of john's book because it's it's a great book um this person had written that reality is the most frightening place. Um, you know, this is feeling awfully true, that reality is a really terrifying place. Both of you are writing fiction about reality in, in, in different ways. I wonder if it's just sort of an open-ended um, comments on this, on this uh, review that reality is the most frightening place. Let's start with, with John. What, what do you think of that? I think it's, you know, one of the weird things about writing um, is, and it's a thing that it's almost impossible to explain to, I mean, I've worked in publishing briefly many times ago, and I, I can't explain why it takes more than a year for a book to come out. You know, I mean, it just is bizarre and incomprehensible, but there is there's this colossal gap. And the cultural moment in which a book actually arrives mm. is, hugely disconnected from the one in your head. I sometimes think it's that, that um, perhaps it, it's an apocryphal thing, but I have a mental image of a place where people do this cave diving. And it's so the cliff is, they jump off is so high, sorry, cliff diving with the kind of vertiginous drop and this sort of sucking inlet at the bottom. And it's so steep and so high and the waves come in so abruptly that at the point they jump off, there's no water. They have to time it and the water comes in and they land in the water as they, Oh God, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty apt image of uh, marketing trends. Exactly, that's what it's like having a book out. You just don't know. And you know, <laughs> some of the time the water comes in and you know, actually let's be honest, some of the time it doesn't. Um, Often, yeah. <laughs> so the kind of profound um, unsettlingness of this, this moment and the kind of weird, particularly the weirdness of contact without contact that we're actually engaged in at the moment, you know, talking about that word unheimlich, uncanny, there is something uncanny about the amount of presence without presence we're, we're having and this sort of disconnected, you know, I can go out for a walk, it's nighttime here in London, I can go for a walk around, and these streets are not like they normally are, you know, 11.30 in the night in the middle of town, it's, it's just, it's a deeply altered reality, I'm sure we're all experiencing versions of that. Um, but it couldn't have been less like the landscape that was around when I was writing the stories when, you know, everything was ticking along normally. And um, this sort of jolting, disconnected um, otherness of the current moment is just something that wasn't there when I was writing the book. This idea of reality and, and non-reality, I, I want to try and um, tie it to another question I had for both of you, but starting with the, the ping, how do you, how did you get at reality with the different tools available to you as a writer? You, you're, you use absurdist humor quite a bit in your stories. Um, so I wonder, especially as a journalist, if you could talk a little bit about how you tackled reality and non-reality in these, in these stories. Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, hearing you describe reality is just how frightening reality can be. I'm, I'm thinking of one story in the book, the one that closes it, um, which is a, it tells a story. It's one, it's one of the ones that is more absurdist um, and surreal. It's the story of a group of commuters who end up trapped 
uh, in a Beijing subway tunnel deep underground for months at end and, and denied official permission to leave for a really bureaucratic reason. And it's on the surface, you know, it's there's nothing really frightening that happens except that they are so much at the whim of the government. And we see so quickly how their lives change and become so much outside their control and they have to, you know, essentially rethink their identities um, while living underground and, and they form the society. We see bonds that um, come together and fray and I'm thinking of it, um, especially because it's again, not one that, I, it doesn't have ghosts in it, but it is very much about kind of the terrors of the human spirit and just how frightening it is that we, as individuals and as a collective can be so adaptable. Over time we see in the story, um, people again start to become really comfortable with these new strictures that the government has put on them. And it, it evolves in different ways. Um, I won't, won't give away the ending, but it, it's something that a number of readers have observed to me is, is um, very reminiscent of kind of the current moment that we're in of the pandemic when, when again, many of us are, you know, feeling so trapped and trapped in place. And it's, it's something that I think for me writing, um, you, know, you think you were asking about journalism and fiction. And for me, I think the ability to use some of the tools of magical realism and surrealism, um, like in the story, you know, placing, placing these characters in the situation is just in many ways to try and um, get at some of the truths about what it's like in some ways, you know, to live in a society where, where your choices are so radically constrained, um, to explore it in a way that I think, you know, that you, you couldn't in journalism. It's, the story is intended to be, um, you know, sort of this, this dark fairy tale, almost like a claustrophobic um, experience in some ways reading it, I think. Um, but also it's, it's one that I think the lens of fiction really allows you to, to ask the reader to engage in and, and think if I was one of these people, you know, living in this circumstance, how would I respond? Would I, you know, would I want to break out? How would I do it? Um, and I think to really assess, you know, and, and reassess what it, what it means to be human and to, to be living in a society where things are distorted or broken um, in ways that feel outside your control, you know, and how do we respond? And um, I mean, that, that's a question that for me was really at the heart of a lot of these stories. Um, whether with, with this one or the, the story that opens the collection, uh, which is, you know, tells the story of a pair of twins, one who becomes a professional video gamer um, and his sister who becomes a sort of online dissident and activist. And I think, um, you know, those, those were the sorts of characters that I very much did write about in a journalistic context, right? Um, those are the sorts of stories that you often, you know, as foreign correspondent in China do write about. But I think the lens of fiction, just allowing readers to really get to you know, not just meet a character at the end of their journey, you know, when, when they've already embarked upon this path of activism, say, in the, in the case of the opening story, Lulu, um, but also to understand, you know, the family context, the, to, to see the interplay of these deep relationships, right? Like no one character, you know, you might, in a news story, you might encounter one character. Um, and, and yet, you know, like you unspool who they are, their families, their, you know, their siblings, and you, and you start to see a whole world. And I think that's something that fiction is just really able to capture in a way that is, is of course, much harder to do through, through a narrow lens of, of print. And you did, you I mean, captured I, I, it so I that. I don't, can I, I don't add one? I oh, please do. That because I think sometimes you have a thing as if, it, as I write, I do journalism, nonfiction too. And sometimes if you describe something, you're interested in something in the world. And I've been following technology and been writing about it for a long time but you can have this thing of the story that you aren't able to tell just by writing about the externals, by saying what happened. There's a kind of, there's another landscape to it. And I, I became aware, as I say, I was about halfway through this book before I realized what it was about. But I realized that part of it was that um, I'd written and read quite a lot about the kind of sociology and the politics and the economics of technology and of how we all connect with each other, like we're connecting with each other now. But I come to think that there was a sort of another side that's being left out about its effect on ourselves mm -hmm. and how we um, not just interact with each other, but actually interact with ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, our actual, how we're wired, our kind of, um, our, our self-image, our inner being. And that's one of the things you can do in fiction. You can go, you can go down and in into, into the self um, in a way that it's actually 
other forms of writing don't really let you do in quite the same way. There's another, there's a whole other set of things you can open up in fictional forms. And it, so both of your, your, your answers um, sort of dovetail on another question slash comment that I had. Um, I'd looked at an interview that Ping did with her publisher, which um, is posted online in which she raised an interesting point. What is it, a, a preoccupation, what is it like to grow comfortable and even thrive in a repressive system? And it's funny because I, I read that on, on, you know, it was about the Ping's work, but I thought, gosh, this, this really makes me think of so many of the stories in, in reality. So, you know, John, you, you shared that at first you didn't quite see the overarching preoccupation with some of this digital technology, but then your, your wife pointed it out. Um, let's talk a little bit more of, you know, is technology digital technology? Is it a repressive system or, or is, it, is it more, uh, it's the humans who are, are using it wrong? You know, and let's talk about the sort of discovery of what's happening to the self in, in your collection. Well, it definitely has the potential to be repressive, as the thing you know can tell you at greater length than I can. I, mean, I, I grew up in Hong Kong and was there during the protests in 2019, and you know the potential for kind of complete state control through technology is a, a you know is a story that I mean, unfortunately we're only at the beginning of, I fear. Um, but I think, I mean, Zadie Smith wrote a wonderful thing in the New York Review about. Um, having done um, an M, she did a, a, an MA as a graduate student at Harvard. She had a first degree at Cambridge and then went back a few years later to teach. And in her, in her view, the students, the undergraduates had actually changed in that time. And the, the thing that had changed them was Facebook hmm. and that people presented themselves in a, in a different way. They had a different, sense of selfhood i'm really interested in that i'm really and it's a thing i notice i've got my kids are younger than you guys i think my, my they're 22 and 18 and it's 23 now actually and 18 and it's quite striking that they're even in that micro generational gap five-year gap they use technology differently and they sort of expect different things from it and they have they're sort of suspicious of of different things the 23 year old is you know, they use Facebook for a bit and then they stop that generation. And my 18 year old would be more likely to, you know, um, be the first man on Mars than to use Facebook. Facebook is for old people. Um, you know, twi Twitter is for, you know, really old people. Um, uh, you know, and, the, and their sort of sense of what's ironic mm -hmm. and the kind of velocity of their engagement with things really shifts quite profoundly. I, 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 I definitely think there's a sense of how we describe ourselves to ourselves that is being shifted by technology, sometimes in ways that are quite toxic. I think some of the, you know, for a long time, you know, people talking about Instagram as the most benign form of social media, because it was just, you know, looking at puppies and sunsets. And actually, in fact, I think it's quite possibly it's the most most toxic of all of them because it's the one that um, can quite easily be all about your self-image. Um, so I think there are really quite profound shifts happening in that that thing about describing your own reality to your, as we say, the crucial things to yourself. That's where the that's where the real high stakes thing happens. I think that's fascinating to think about how the present presentation of self has changed because I do find in. in in you know my social circles or social circle circles of yore when I used to socialize, people do sort of present themselves as a, you know, like a, a vitamin uh, pack with an ingredient label or something. They just have bullet points sort of on their chest that you're just supposed to absorb because in theory you've already been exposed to their social media or you know again it's hard to I want to say nowadays but you know in pre-pandemic times if you ran into a friend you hadn't seen very often they'd say oh you know how was Florida but you haven't introduced the fact that you went to Florida they saw it on your 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 Instagram um 
I knew that this would happen because I wanted to talk to both of you all night, but for John, it's very late. And for the ping, she has another event. So I want to fit in one more question, which is a little more specific to the ping um, about upward mobility. I, as I was reading your collection, I found moments um, where you used imagery and metaphor um, about upward mobility in such masterful ways. So think about, um, I think about the story that be end up becoming titled Shanghai Murmur, where there is, um, I don't wanna give anything away, a, a Mont Blanc fountain pen that comes in to completely upend a, a young woman's trajectory. And so Mont Blanc, if you know the fountain pen brand, it's a luxury pen. But beyond just being a luxury pen, the logo for Mont Blanc is a, it's a pinnacle, it's a mountain, right? It's the highest of the high. And then you have, um, wait, I don't want to misspeak, um, Gubeco Spirit, I apologize if I, I pronounce that incorrectly, where you have a, a rural farmer who, you know, even though all of his neighbors are making fun of him, he decides to try and build an airplane. Um, so perhaps this is more of a compliment than a question, but I, I wonder, I don't know, is, is, does this sort of masterful imagery just come out of you <laughs> naturally? Um, or how do you do it? <laughs> how, how, yeah, can we talk about upward mobility a little bit in, in Land of Big Numbers? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. Um, well, first of all, thank you. That's really enormously kind of you to say. And you've, you've identified two of the characters who are dearest to my heart out of that collection. <laughs> and it's really because I think they embody so much I mean, it's a spirit, of course, that you can encounter in China, but also one I think that reminds me a lot of, you know, a very American spirit too. This, this sense of possibility, right? Of of looking upwards, the upward gaze, and seeing seeing what, you know, what you can, how you can transform your own life. I mean, it's just such a beautiful and potent thing. And I think too, just of these characters who see the world and its possibilities, and it's the possibilities of beauty that uh, await them too, which is something that I think, you know, it makes me think, you know, with this, this whole wonderful festival about books, like the whole fictional impulse and desire to read, right? And so much is in seeking that sense of engagement with possibility and opening yourself up to different worlds, right? Just as Chalet does when she, you know, sets out from her small village to, to make it to Shanghai or Tsao when he, you know, he sees beyond his own circumstances and he desires to build the most extraordinary thing, an airplane, you know, it's, it's that desire that I think just animate, I mean, it's at the base of everything, right? It's, it's, our, it's our hunger for other people um, and understanding for other people. Um, it's a really extraordinary trait. And I think, of course, one that you see magnified and I think in, in China often just because of the scale of change and disruption that really lends itself to these extraordinary stories and narratives, um, some of which are captured in this book. But yeah, I mean, I think just it really was something that um, you know, in a book that of course is threaded with with allegory and, and some politics, um, and dark darkness as well, but I think at the core of it, really, like that that thread of fire is just the ability to have that upper gaze and see what is possible, and to to set out to try and make it so, which I think is just something so beautiful, and and that I wanted to pay tribute to. <laughs> you 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 did it really really well. So thank you, thank you for that 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 wonderful answer. So we have arrived already at seven forty five. So before. I read my scripted outro, which until recently I thought was an outro. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to remind everyone, you know, the thing just gave a beautiful summary of, of the, the emotions and sort of atmosphere you get in her book, of, you know, the, the possibility for connection and the hunger for other people. And John's stories, I mean, you, you can't believe the people and the situations you'll meet in his book. Um, demonic selfie sticks, 
father-in-laws who keep calling the daughter-in-law from beyond the grave. I mean, absolute nightmare scenarios. <laughs> I sometimes feel like I'm in that scenario myself, but both, co both collections really do speak to, I think, loneliness and the impetus of all humans to avoid loneliness. And so I really do hope that you'll you'll pick up their collections and support their, their past and, and future work so that we can all stay in conversation together. Um, I'm going to read my printed outro, outro now, please. Um, thank you <laughs> to Ping and John. Thank you to everyone watching with us um, in all your different modes and modalities. Uh, please consider, but you know, a lot of this I already accomplished. So uh, please check out other events in the all virtual, very accessible, super affordable 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. And I want everyone to have a beautiful day, evening, night. For John, we wish you a sweet dreams because it's quite late. Uh, depending, good luck with your next event and all of your future work and thank you so much both of you for being so candid and generous and sharing uh slaughtered work with us and um it was a real pleasure uh thank you for being with us thank you for having us <laughs> goodbye so. everyone <laughs>